Welcome everybody to the Florida Horticulture for Health Network webinar. Um, I'm really excited about this webinar. This is called Sewing Cemeteries and Seed Libraries, Inspiration from Shipley School's Horticulture Program, and it's going to be really interesting. Um, a couple of things. If you have questions or comments, please put those in the chat box. We will be keeping track of those. We'll probably hold the questions and answering the questions to the end. Um, although there may be an interactive component um, in the midst of the of the webinar, so you'll also have an opportunity to respond if you want to within the chat box. But that's where all your thoughts and comments should go, and we will um, do our best to address them toward the end of the webinar. So again, thank you for being here. If you aren't familiar with the Florida Horticulture for Health Network, I really urge you to take a look at the website. It's got a fantastic variety of really great resources on everything you can imagine that involves horticulture and health. So here's our information here. And what I'd like to do next is to introduce our speaker. And I'm so excited to have Sarah with us today. Sarah Sterling is a licensed social worker and her professional career has focused on adolescent mental health and well being. She is the Associate Director of College Counseling and the Coordinator of Educational Horticulture at the Shipley School. Sarah uses her training in horticultural therapy to identify innovative ways to connect students with the natural world while also teaching self-regulation techniques that can be adapted to a variety of post-secondary settings. One of the reasons I'm so excited to have Sarah here is because she is a graduate of our Certificate in Horticultural Therapy program here at University of Florida. I believe, Sarah, if I'm correct, you finished in the summer of 2021. I think that's right. I um, so. <laughs> that's all right, yes, good. And um, also this past summer, she presented a session at the National Children and Youth Garden Symposium, which was very exciting. Um, that was in Richmond, Virginia, and a really important conference. So Sarah, I am gonna pass it over to you, and we're just really happy that you're here. Thanks, Lee. I am grateful for the invitation. Um, I think that what we're doing at Shipley is very unique. It is um, a little bit of my um, my own little child as it relates to horticulture and, and horticultural therapy. And so I'm excited to share a little bit about what we're doing with, with other folks. Uh, let's see here. All right. So um, as Lee mentioned, I um, am the coordinator of horticultural uh, educational horticulture at the Shipley School. Um, and if you can see from my penance behind me, I'm um, mostly the Associate Director of College Counseling. Um, so really a lot of my work is focused on how to get students successfully into the next stages of their lives, whatever that might be. Um, Shipley is a pre-K through 12 independent school a few miles outside of Philadelphia. Um, we work with neurotypical students um, who um, have come from a wide range of areas, including the Center City Philadelphia um, suburbs. So they are coming from a lot of different, um, I guess, uh, demographics as far as socioeconomic status. Um, we have a lot of international students, um, especially from China and other locations. So it's a fairly diverse um, student body, but an independent um, school. So we're given a lot of flexibility and autonomy um, in our programming. Uh, so schools need horticulture. <laughs> I think that um, the world is continuing to become urbanized and digitized, and so our children's connection to the natural world is really diminishing. Um, one solution for this has been the school garden, which there's been a lot of research on, and I think folks, um, you know, rightfully so, are trying to include more gardens in schools. But this can be a huge problem. Um, space is an issue for a lot of schools, especially urban and suburban institutions. Money is always a problem um, unless you have, um, you know, a specific donor or funding source. Um, even grants can sometimes help start up gardens, but they don't always allow you to maintain them. And then the maintenance of those gardens is really the most critical kind of dilemma as far as a limitation for schools having school gardens in that Staff are not around in the summertime um, and they are very busy doing other things. And so what you end up with is the start of a garden and sometimes the follow through um, where it would be most beneficial for students um, is lacking. So I think that there is the need to kind of expand this idea of how we're incorporating horticulture into schools. As many of you might know, horticulture is the science and art 
of growing plants. It's a really great way to reconnect young people with the natural world. And both active and passive um, horticulture work can be really beneficial to student well being. So, whether they're directly involved in planting and care of those plants, or if they are just passing by them, whether it be in the classroom um, or outside somewhere on the school campus, it can be um, really beneficial to their mental health um, and can give them a lot of pride if they are actually part of that planting process. So there have been many, many studies who have, de have demonstrated the emotional benefits to school gardens. Um, when it comes to horticulture at Shipley, we really prioritize the emotional and social well-being, which I'll get to in just a moment. Um, some of the studies have talked about school gardens as allowing students to feel calm, safe, happy, and relaxed. Some DEI work as well, allowing students to accept people who are different from themselves and increasing their understanding and interpersonal skills and cooperative skills. A lot of these studies have actually worked in school gardens, though, and so Part of it is what happens with horticulture when it's being done not in the school garden setting. Um, at Shipley, we have a long history of horticulture education without a school garden. In fact, the little raised beds in this picture here um, were only installed about a year ago. Um, we've had decades of a horticulture program that has been run um, in our classrooms and in our community um, and in a small um, lean-to style greenhouse that we have on campus. Um, and it's known as the Sprouts program at Shipley, um, which has expanded um, from just being an upper school or high school program to a pre-K through 12 program recently. Some of what our students have expressed and part of why this became such a fascination of mine and I decided to enroll in the University of Florida's um, certificate in horticultural therapy was because of what I was seeing from my students. So these are some quotes for them. Um, I love this. Sprouts has made my high school life happier and more manageable. Every club meeting consistently enlightens my week and greatly reduces stress from not only academic pressures, but also social and mental stresses. The camaraderie between the members creates a safe space where students feel free to share and confide in each other, a rare thing in high school, and we all leave the greenhouse with a clearer mind and lighter heart. So we are seeing a lot of this from our students and trying to think about well, in the absence of a school garden, how can we help more students feel this, more students benefit from the um, stress reduction that you're seeing um, in the greenhouse and when they're participating in horticulture-based activities? So horticulture at the Shipley School has kind of shifted recently. It used to be these very small, um, opportunities around winter time where students would participate in greening the school, which was making some wreaths and other um, little activities that would, um, you know, brighten the surroundings and that sort of thing. We recently expanded that where students are responsible for um, helping alumni and even parents plant these seasonal planter boxes, which there's 17 now located on campus where they have to design and plant um, a variety of different, um, mostly living <laughs> uh, plants into them. The one on the left, the winter planter was done last year. And some of our um, students worked in our maker space to help print these little characters to go in the lower school planter boxes. Um, and in the springtime, the students plant bulbs. Well, they plant them in the winter time and then we force bulbs to grow in our greenhouse that can be used in the, the springtime planters. And what we really see with this is ownership and pride. And then those who are actively participating in it get those benefits, but the students who are just passing by have a newfound kind of respect for the school um, environment and um, walking past these planters every day as they enter the building can be a really welcoming aspect of the community. So I have these little things called bookworms in this presentation, which I thought would be a fun way to introduce a few books and resources to folks, whether you're working at a school or elsewhere. Um, my first is this um, bulb forcing book by Art Walk, who is a huge, um, he is like 
a huge mainstay of the Philadelphia Flower Show, which I'll get to in a minute. But this book is so cool because it includes a chart of the types of bulbs that folks might be planting and how much time it takes for them to grow. So even if you are in Florida and you don't have the same winter season that we have here in Pennsylvania, um, it would allow you to have some bulbs and know how many weeks you have um, with them between when they are planted or potted up um, and when they will bloom. Um, and you'll see some bulbs throughout this presentation. Um, bulbs don't need a greenhouse to grow. They can grow on a windowsill. Um, they are various sizes. So some people think about those large amaryllis bulbs that you often see at wintertime, which are often used inside, but they can be little tiny muscari bulbs, which our students love planting in tiny little um, containers and having in their homes and classrooms as well. So for several decades, the upper school at Shipley has had um, our Sprouts Club exhibit at the Philadelphia Flower Show. And I think that competitive and horticulture are not two terms that are often put together. <laughs> um, but when it comes to school-based horticulture, I think that it's something that we need to consider um, more and more. Um, students participate frequently in athletics, Science Olympiad, Model UN. And so, um, you know, if they can have these other competitions, why not horticulture? The best way to show you what's happening with our horticulture program and what competitive horticulture means is actually a short um, video that one of my students made a couple of years ago. This will be the behind the scenes of the Philadelphia Flower Show. So you'll get to see what they're experiencing and then you're gonna have a little activity so that you can experience what it's like to um, take on one of the horticultural design challenges that our students are participating in. Let me get in here. <clears throat> and while Sarah is bringing that video up for us, just a reminder, if you have any questions or comments to put them in the chat box and we will um, try to address them toward the end. All right, can you see that, Lee? Yes, I can see the screen, not a picture yet, but I can. Is that good? I can't. There we go, yes, yep, good. The Sprouts is a quiet but large and important group in our Shipley community. Every year I attend the Philadelphia Flowers Show with my dad. the Philadelphia Flower Show with my Every year I attend the Philadelphia Flower Show with my dad. And every year I am fascinated by how people my school can win so many awards. This year, Mr. Lang invited me to come along with the Sprouts as they entered their submissions into the Philadelphia Flower Show. There, I would be able to scope out our competition and get to learn about the complicated submission process. When we first arrived, Ms. Sterling took us to a table. She took out different brushes and clippers for the students to make their gardens as neat as possible for the judges. She also had different sheets of paper, which were keys for each of the students' gardens. I take it over to a passer, and the passer's um, job is to make sure that their diagrams are accurate and that they have the cards with their names and stuff on them. Once it gets passed, someone places it so that you're not raise it, puts it out, but so that they're like placing it on the, the spot where it goes. And so once it gets passed, you can't touch it any longer. Then I went with Sebastian to capture the passing process. I noticed how particular the passers are about each leaf and rock being in line. So now we're moving on to 
Entries. So all of the kids have done small succulent gardens, and so now they have all of the bulbs that they're entering for today, which have to be groomed to perfection and then also passed and entered um, into the show. It has to be perfect. There's something called cultural perfection, which is like the plant being perfect with no blemishes, no bugs, no nothing, and so you want it to be as culturally perfect as possible. Then I noticed Julia was gone for a while, so I went over to check on Julia and her succulent turtle, which was in the process of being passed. Shortly after I got there, the judges gave her the okay. Okay, you're all set up. I am, thank you so much. Thank you. Then Mr. and Mrs. Turner stopped by to say hello. It meant a lot to the students that they came to the show to see their work. They definitely seemed to have a great time. Later, I asked Ms. Sterling how the Shigley Sprout benefits the students and how she wants the program to grow in the future. I definitely think that students get a big relief when they just spend time in the greenhouse and then the added benefits of gardening and learning how plants grow and feeling like you have ownership over something I think is really important. Um, it's also really beautiful. Yeah. Um, I'm hoping to involve the lower a little bit more. Because I think that cool. the little kids, I'm hoping to get some like garden space at the lower school. But I think that if the lower school kids were doing the flower show, it would be adorable. Really cute. Here's Shipley's first large show piece, which many visitors were admiring. Once I got back to the box, Julia had gotten the first blue ribbon of the day. First of the day. Hi, Madison. How do you feel? I feel so great. First big win. We're like sprouts. And we're just killing it right now. <laughs> Even though we weren't able to stay for the rest of the judging, we had a fabulous time. I learned so much about how they get the flowers ready, get them passed, and then judged. I now have a greater appreciation for the flower show runners and the students that participate. Thank you to the Shipley Sprouts who treated me as one of their own as I came along. All right, did that transition back to the um, presentation work, Lee? Yep, it's perfect. Okay, great. So that um, the video always makes me smile so much because my student that was created in 2020 right before the pandemic hit. Um, and I think that the benefits of these types of horticulture programs have only increased as our students have continued to spend so much time on technology and, and disconnected from one another, which I'll get to speak a little bit more about. But um, watching that video from my student who's in college to do filmmaking is <laughs> such a, a joy of mine. Um, this component of the presentation I'm calling a, a dumpster dive. There's become this joke um, that Ms. Sterling is always in a, a dumpster on <laughs> campus, which is not true. I'm not in them that often. Um, there's a lot of great things in dumpsters, but I think that um, it would be fun for you all, those of you who are willing to participate, to take on your own little design challenge. Um, and then I'll share with you what we've done for the Philadelphia Flower Shows and, and what our students have collaborated on um, and come up with for recent flower shows. Um, so this is going to be your little challenge, and I want you to get your chats ready because you'll get to, to use those in a moment. Um, here is your task. So this um, it was an actual design challenge for, for the flower show. Um, you need to create a habitat for a creature, big or small, and name the creature. And then for this challenge, folks had to, in real life, use at least eight plants. But I want you to think about one or two plants that if you were creating this miniature setting, um, what creature would you put in it? And what would at least one plant be um, that you would include in your design if you were creating this? So once you think about it for a couple minutes, I want you to put your creature in the chat along with um, one or two plants that you would use if you were making this little setting. So 
Oh, I see Leslie is coming with a hummingbird with salvias and honeysuckles. That would be spectacular. I wonder how miniature you could make the salvias or get the salvias. Oh, Jessica with bees, that would be awesome. That would be so yellow with all the golden rods. And the hermit crab with succulents. They're so easy to work with. That's such a great, great option. Oh, Susan, you have so much design in your idea. Snails are so funny to, to think about because we think of them as such pests, but they're so beautiful, I think, to think about those kind of the curving of the snail shell and the swirly leaves of the begonia. That's a great, a great thought. Fun. Thank you, guys. It's always so funny to see what students come up with and, and even adults come up with for these little challenges. We're going to do one more. Um, yeah, a little bit later on. So um, this was a challenge that our students were given, um, not this past year, but the year before. So when the pandemic happened, the Philadelphia Flower Show moved from inside the convention center, like it was in that little video, to outside. Um, and if you can think about these kind of ideal settings for students to really collaborate in, um, competitive horticulture has proven time and time again to be one of them for us. So the students were tasked with transforming a harsh hell strip located along a busy street into a strip of heaven using rooted plants. Um, this was a large scale exhibit, so it was three feet by 10 feet, um, and we were given a subsidy to do so. And this is what the students came up with um, and we helped build. So this is our little seed library. Um, it was staged in centers or in Philadelphia. And the idea was that the health strip is that strip of land that runs between a road and a sidewalk. It's like often where dogs go to the bathroom and there's trash and that sort of thing. So that's why it's known as a health strip. And to make it heavenly, we used a lot of perennials, a lot of um, uh, flowers that are known for their seeds like echinacea and um, and bee balm and foxglove and there's some salvia in there um, and mint and they the students worked together to build this green roofed little seed library kind of similar to a book library that you would be walking past on the street um, and worked together to design it and build it um, as you can see in one of the the pictures here um, we fortunately won a lot of blues that, that year. It was a very exciting year for us. Um, and the students, again, had to really think and problem solve together and work collaboratively um, to achieve this. That seed library, we ended up donating to an urban farm in Philadelphia. And to not send them an empty seed library, we had to come up with some way to fill it slightly. And so oftentimes one activity like this little library can turn into another. Um, when I was receiving my certificate in horticultural therapy, the seed bombs kept being presented as like a really cool um, activity. And so I thought that I would try it with my students. Um, and we ended up making hundreds of these little seed bombs, which they filled the seed library with. Um, it's a great activity to participate in because it doesn't take that many ingredients. It's highly sensory. The students kept talking about how it was like making truffles or cake pops. Um, some of the students did not like that sensation, but others really did. So sensory, both positively and negatively, good exposure to different textures. Um, and so that was a really um, fun activity. And to also get my um, the upper school students thinking about like adaptive gardening and how different people's bodies develop in different ways. Even with our little kids, it's very hard for them to sprinkle tiny little seeds in the garden. Um, whereas if they've used these seed bombs in the past, um, that's been a different way to help them, them plant um, and learn about spacing of plants as well. 
So ensuring that all of our students are benefiting in a really robust way um, to their interactions with plants is one of the main goals of our horticulture program. So whenever I'm designing an activity, I like to make sure that there's elements of horticultural therapy. Um, most of these, um, given the population that I'm working with, which again is um, neurotypical children, pre-K through 12th grade, um, many of the activities are highly sensory, um, but very, very social. And I think, as I was mentioning earlier, with the COVID-19 pandemic, we are seeing more and more of our students from pre-K through 12 who are a little bit behind as far as not their ability to like talk to their peers, but their ability to really collaborate, which is such an important skill as they're looking at college um, or work beyond high school. Um, and so, um, the other aspect of it besides the socialization is that sensory component. So in the built environment, they're touching their computer, their computer pads, desks, even the lower school, which has a playground. Um, the most natural material on that playground is wood chips. And so um, activities that really allow them to use many different um, plants and different um, like both living and non-living organisms tend to be really, really helpful to us. So though I spent my time um, in growing up in the woods in Michigan, I never heard about fairy gardens until I became a parent. Um, fairy gardens, miniature landscapes, painted rocks, these are all activities that we've done with our youngest students. Um, and they work really well in the classroom and outside of the classroom. So if they can find little nooks um, on campus to make little fairy gardens, they do so. But our science teacher also has them make these little inside fairy gardens and design them. There's definitely elements of, of horticultural design that comes into play, that it's not just the science of growing and caring for plants, but it's really that creative artistic side of horticulture as well. Um, this brings us to our second bookworm, Botanical Inks. This is a new book that I've used recently with my students, which is all about um, plants as dyes. Um, we worked on this hapazome project recently, which if you get a bunch of stressed out teenagers in a greenhouse hammering plant um, dyes into fabric, <laughs> it's a huge stress reliever. Um, and they used um, these hapazome prints in another activity that we do, um, which is Longwood Children's Ornaments. So I found that local botanical gardens and public lands are often really great um, partners to inspire school-based horticulture. Um, the flower show, which the Philadelphia flower show is specific to Philadelphia, there are flower shows all over the country, all over the world. Oftentimes, um, some plate times institutions will even house their own little um, flower show. So the competitive horticulture piece is something that's accessible to many more people than what I think they recognize. And then public gardens and botanical gardens often have opportunities as well to get children um, interacting with the natural world and doing some interesting design work. So the Longwood Children's Trees Longwood is a beautiful garden outside of Philadelphia. Every winter they have a huge Christmas um, display that goes on for several months. And they have um, for a long time had these children's trees um, where school groups and um, other organizations can kind of apply with some design ideas and then have students create ornaments to go along with them. You have to make about 350 ornaments. Um, that all have to be handmade by the students. So when we did this last year, the theme was ice and our students um, took a scientific approach to it and made crystals, cubes and molecules. These are some of the cubes that um, the big kids made. They went out all around campus and found and collected a lot of different um, flowers and seeds and berries and rocks and all sorts of things. And then we froze them into resin ice cubes to hang on the tree. Um, there was a lot of science involved in that because I have not used a boxy resin before. Um, and they were fascinated by the way that some of the plants changed colors once they were in the resin. Um, you can see the, the purple geranium on the far 
left turned blue almost immediately as soon as it interacted with the chemicals in the resin. Um, and so it was a really fascinating activity. And then later on, many of the students and some of the families were able to see the tree at, um, at Longwood Gardens. And this is gonna take us to another dumpster dive because it is just now Longwood children's tree season. Um, and so I'm gonna let you guys put in the chat another one. See here. Okay, here's your challenge. The theme this year was botanical splendor. So um, it's very, very broad. It is not specific like ice. I want you to think of any idea you can for an ornament, or if you're not into ornaments, um, a small sculpture that would demonstrate botanical splendor to you and what it means to you. Um, and think if you can um, have it be made out of natural or reclaimed or recycled materials, um, that would be much more on par with a school budget. <laughs> so think if you can uh, come up with an ornament or small sculpture and throw that in the chat in the next couple of minutes. Oh, Kimberly, how beautiful. That's a great idea. I'm going to have to look up to see what those seed heads look like to think about how they could become gnomes, an okra seed head. Oh, and Leslie, that smell would be fantastic. Oh, these are such great ideas. I'm gonna to have to read through some of these. So I saw seed balls with the hooks on them. That would definitely be botanical splendor. Um, snowflakes made using natural materials, small framing, oh, picture frames with sticks and decorated with flowers. Bamboo everything. <laughs> I like that idea, Jessica. <laughs> And the seed pods. Yeah, all of those seed pods are so fascinating shapes and textures to be able to use. They're definitely splendid. Um, yeah, and milkweed pods. Fantastic. These are great. Thank you guys so much for participating in this. I was trying to demons have you experience what our students experience when they're given these little challenges um, because everybody comes up with so many different fascinating ideas. Um, we had mosaics that were made this year for the botanical splendor theme. We made those hapazome ornaments. Um, our littlest students made hummingbirds out of um, pine cones and um, acorns and some wings out of um, dried leaves. And so um, I'm excited to see them on the tree here in the coming weeks. All right, this is our last bookworm of the day, which is Garden Anywhere, um, Alice Fowler. She ends up in dumpsters a lot in this book, um, which is not where it inspired me, but um, this sense that you can garden anywhere. It doesn't have to be in a garden. Um, it can be in found yogurt containers on windowsills. It can be in, um, you know, small raised beds if you have space for that. It can be, um, horticulture can be ornaments, making ornaments out of natural materials or small fairy gardens or really anything that we dream of. So it feels like grave gardening would be the best project to end this little presentation on. So I wanna make sure that I have some time for questions and answers. Um, in the spring of 2021, which just to place everyone, um, our school shut down in the spring of 2020. Most of our students were um, virtual or hybrid for that fall of 2020. And in the spring of 2021, we're trying to think of ways to just get people outside and able to do something collaborative because um, there was a lot of, you know, you had to be six feet apart and there was masking and everything else. So we approached um, Lower Marion Baptist Church Cemetery, which is a, a 10 minute walk from our campus. Um, it's a historic cemetery that was established in 1811. And we had this idea of 
asking if we could garden in their cradle graves. So the, the graves that are pictured here are known as cradle graves, not because they have children in them, but because of the shape of the grave. They were very popular on the East Coast during the Victorian era. Um, and they said yes, um, and were very, very wonderful about allowing our students on campus. Um, and they partnered with the Lower Marion Baptist Church and an organization called the Legacy Marker Project um, on this program for seniors that's called History and Horticulture. So we used the cemetery as an outdoor classroom and really it turned into like a living laboratory because the students learned very quickly that they had a lot of autonomy and could make mistakes and could run through the cemetery and they weren't messing anything up. Um, and it was a really wonderful place for them to be outside and working together on this design project. And we had 12 students and a group of volunteers um, and they worked for three weeks on the senior service project where they um, they had to actually rebuild the cradle graves. They at one point had to use a two ton crank along with legacy marker um, program to move the sides of the cradle graves and rebuild them because they had come into such disrepair. Um, they did a lot of headstone cleaning um, and invasive plant removal and um, headstone restoration and then gardened within the cemetery. So we went from being a school that at that point had no outdoor gardening space to having this um, eight acre cemetery for the students to, to be in and garden in. Um, this year, this past year, our work focused on beautifying this place called the Hamilton Plot. So in the top um, left-hand corner, you can see what it looked like before. Cemeteries have a lot of issues just with being spaces that are constantly needing to be mowed and weed whacked and the weed whackers um, damage the headstones. And so the cemetery was interested in um, creating more spaces that were growing with plants and flowers so they didn't need to be weed whacked. And the Hamilton plot was one place that we identified. So the students threw out all the grass in the middle and ended up making um, this really beautiful perennial planting. It mostly included native plants. Um, and it, it, you can see in the bottom left-hand picture, included a walkway so that folks could still walk in the path um, and in the plot. Um, and this is a centerpiece of the cemetery. So when you get to the cemetery, this is one of the first plots that people see. And so it gave visitors also this sense of like what the cemetery values and demonstrated how um, this notion of perpetual care, which is what a lot of cemeteries are based on, um, can really change over time. So what is caring for a cemetery um, through climate change and in this century look like um, compared to what it was like in the early 18, 1800s um, when the cemetery was established. Um, so this was a very important project for a lot of our students. And again, it was seniors working on this project. Um, and they really thought very creatively about how to design this small space um, and put a lot of work <laughs> and effort into um, redesigning the Hamilton plot. I've since gotten a lot of pictures from the church secretary who every time there's an animal in the Hamilton plot, um, sometimes it's deer going for the perennials. Um, she sends me a picture. It's like so much life here in the cemetery. It's very sweet. So um, I'm hoping that this presentation allowed you to rethink a little bit of what um, school gardens can be so that whether the idea is really, really big um, or really tiny or super weird that we can allow students to move forward, um, engage with the natural world in a really creative and I would say awe-inspiring way um, and allow them to benefit from all of the wonderful emotional and social um, uh, benefits of, of gardening. Thank you, I can open up for questions now. Sarah, thank you so much. That was a wonderful presentation and just such full of great ideas and different ways to, you know, look at projects and activities and, and all sorts of things like that. So I really appreciate it. And we would love to have some questions um, in the chat. And Leslie has posted something that I, I have the same question. So I'm going to kind of turn it into a question. In terms of that last section that you talked about with the cradle graves, you know, in the United States, I think the American culture has struggles with 
the concept of death. And we don't really address it, really. We just try to not think about it in many cases. I'm just curious if you found with the students that were participating with you in that project, did you have any sense of whether maybe the concept of a cemetery became less scary or that just thinking about that cycle a little bit was easier for them? Yeah, I think so. So when we first started working in the cemetery, we did two things. One, we asked all of the students um, whether or not they had ever been in a cemetery before and tried to gauge their comfort with being in a cemetery. Many had never set foot in a cemetery before. I think they're always thought of as like, oh, don't go there or you have to like you can only go there if someone, you know, is buried there. And there's a lot of like rules that aren't actually rules that people associate with cemeteries. Um, and so many had never set foot in the cemetery and they were very, very uncomfortable at first. And the next thing that we did was we sent them on a crazy scavenger hunt <laughs> to get them familiar with the cemetery, like find a headstone of someone who shares your name or something like that so that they could start to feel comfortable with it. What we found was that as the weeks moved on, the conversations that happened about death, about dying, about their family's traditions of burial and cremation, about um, their fears related to our school setting now when there are, you know, active shooter drills and, and school shootings and that sort of thing. They all tend to come up really naturally. And, and students, I don't feel like in the classroom, unless there's a specific conversation that related to a book or something like that, that people are talking much about death and dying and, and grief. Um, but the cemetery, it comes up very, very naturally. Um, and so that was a, a huge benefit. Um, we took, we have an ongoing relationship with the cemetery. So every month we take a group of students over, um, especially in the middle school. And the conversations, I don't work often with middle schoolers, but the conversations that they have in the cemetery were so fascinating. They were like working together and one student started opening up and sharing about how the last time they were in the cemetery was when they were very, um, they were like eight and one of their friends at a previous school had 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 cancer and had died. And so it was incredibly fascinating to just to hear about those conversations. And they didn't need, you know, we didn't need to intervene at all. It wasn't, it wasn't like a, a counseling moment, but it really helped normalize death and what they were feeling. Um, and also, I think they learned a lot about each other and how that part of our lives also differs greatly. That's fascinating. I'm, I'm happy to hear that. And I, it's so interesting. You just think about if we can just expose students and children to some of these environments, maybe that's all we need to do <laughs> to help them become more comfortable. But that's really neat. And of course, the academic in me is thinking, let's do a research project. <laughs> I'm their, in, Lee. I'm in. Yeah. <laughs> well, thank you. Um, Susan has a question about how do you facilitate the fairy garden or mini landscape activities with younger students? Do students make one larger garden with the entire class or smaller gardens with smaller groups? And where do you put those gardens? Are they indoors? Are they outdoors? Great. So they have done a few different things. Um, so when there's space outside, our science teacher has let them just kind of go and create fairy gardens. Some students are much more comfortable working on their own than they are in groups. And usually groups that are any bigger than three are not very effective. <laughs> so um, it really depends on um, the space, whether you want to be inside or outside, they both work very, very well. And then how many materials you have. So if you don't have access to a lot of materials, it's better to have small groups of students make small fairy gardens than to have a huge class work on a slightly larger fairy garden together because there's too much conflict. There's It's just so much harder to work in a, in a group that size. If you can think about your own experiences working in groups, that <laughs> probably makes sense to you. Um, we like to use this activity in the winter time um, and indoors because the kids they certainly get outdoor play time, but we deal with snow a lot off and on, and some are much more comfortable um, being in that setting than others. And so having the science teacher know that when they come to the classrooms, they get to start working on their little fairy gardens and they're digging in the dirt and they're, um, you know, making little paths and they have usually collected a whole bins of pine cones and sticks and other things um, in the fall. They are kind of getting access to all those things that might be hidden under the snow for us um, and able to do that inside. Uh, 
I'm muted. Sorry. Um, that provides that continuity too. I think from you know thinking, collecting something a different season and then using it later on. I like that idea. That's great. Um, Leslie is wondering if your educational horticulture are these after school activities? Is it part of a course? Um, and what grades? I know you've mentioned you've mostly work. Uh, some of these programs are most of the older students, but what about some of the other grades too? Yeah, so um, until three years ago, um, the, we didn't have a lower school garden and the horticulture program was a club. So it happened during school um, about two hours a week, one to two hours a week, depending on how the schedule was with a small group of students. And that was only grades nine through 12. Um, and then um, I blew that up <laughs> and and was able to put together a proposal to um, increase our horticulture footprint um, at Shipley. And so now it is a pre-K through 12 program. And the lower school, it's integrated into the science curriculum during the day um, because we have a wonderful science teacher who is always trying to get the kids outside as much as possible. Um, in the middle school, it is also a gardening club. And we have the woman who runs the gardening club is the Latin teacher, and she is doing a lot of interesting work with Latin plant names and the study of Latin um, and is a gardener. And so it's taking place during the school year there. It also is like a push in opportunity for a lot of the classes. So um, I'm very busy in the fall, but um, I've, you know, encouraged English students or students in our English program to go and read in the greenhouse when they're reading, uh, you know, nature literature. Um, and we've done interesting um, Day of the Dead projects with marigolds that are in our gardens with our Spanish program. So there's like the living club components of it, but then there's also just maintaining the spaces so that if and when they are needed for any class, um, teachers have access to them. Um, this year, I'm teaching a horticultural ecology class, um, which is an actual course in our upper school looking at people-plant interactions. So we're studying plants as food and fiber and dyes and shelter and doing a lot of hands-on projects for that one. Wow, that's great. It's just so wonderful to have those opportunities and have the school buy-in in terms of the importance of that. And I love that Latin, cons the, you know, Latin teacher. I, I've I, when I started to realize that, you know, the species, genus and species names and that the species names in Latin usually gave you some kind of clue about the plant, you know, whether it was the fuzziness of the leaf or that it had a white flower or something, it, it made it so much more fun to learn those names, but it also became sort of almost a detective hunt for kind of figuring out some details about the plant. So I think that's a great way to put that into motion. So, um, Let's see, Elizabeth, kind of going along that line, Elizabeth was wondering how your program is funded. She also asked what your, what your classes look like, but you've kind of talked about that and that whether you have a greenhouse space that other teachers also have access to. So our program is funded a little bit from the school that have identified this as a program that they care a lot about. And so they give us a few thousand thousand dollar budget every year. We also um, have a large plant sale um, that happens in the springtime and that money goes towards our program. You could see with the flower show, those um, little competitive design classes, we get stipends for a lot of those those <laughs> components, which is why I'm always on the lookout for like Longwood Gardens will give us $200 to make those ornaments, which is more than enough if you're creative. Um, the flower show will give us a stipend to create those designs. So you can spend a lot of time doing programming that is using um, that stipend to, to complete. We also have a really wonderful donor now as of um, fairly recently who has decided to start um, regularly contributing to the horticulture program. Um, the greenhouse is accessible to anybody. I um, It belongs to me in the sense that I have to water all the plants and take care of it and tell people when it's not working. Um, I have no background in knowing how to do things in greenhouses, so that's been a learn um, as I go uh, thing, but um, it's open to everybody. Um, and like I said, some people use it for, um, they'll need to repot their own plants. They can go in there or if they want to take a classroom of students in there, especially in the wintertime, it becomes a very popular place to take a small group of students um, to read or to just kind of be, you know, be around the, the plants. 
Um, I think that answered those, all those yeah. questions. Absolutely. That's great. Uh, and back to the cemetery program, Susan was wondering what the parents' responses were when you initially presented that program to the school and to have the students go there. Who, you know, knock on wood, because it's ongoing, we haven't heard any complaints from any parents. And this is something that the school has even spotlighted on social media and put in our school magazine and that sort of thing. I think our saving grace with the cemetery is that um, because it's a historic cemetery, there are a lot of veterans that are buried there. And the legacy marker program that we are also collaborating with um, is run by a U.S. Army veteran. Um, and I think in our community, we don't have a lot of um, folks who are involved in the military or veterans and students aren't really interacting with them that often. And so this idea of like giving back and volunteering in a way that they are involved in the perpetual care of the final resting place of members of our military that no one else is caring for um, is a really big and I think easy selling factor. Um, but and also we're not having, you know, we're not having too many religious conversations. The students are talking about a variety of things, but the, the purpose of that is the history and the horticulture and not linked to a specific, you know, religious practice when it comes to death and dying. Right. That makes sense. Well, and it, just from your pictures, it's clearly so beautiful that, you know, that's just got to be a positive, positive aspect of it as well. Um, Teresa just was making a suggestion I, uh, to say, look at PA Ag, I'm assuming that's Pennsylvania Ag in the classroom online yeah. for a yearly grant program. Great. That's a great recommendation. I'm familiar with that program. So I have to always have reminders to check is very helpful. Yeah. Thank you. And then um, Leslie posed a question, what is neurotypical students? Can you define this or help us understand what students are strong and may need, or what students are strong in and what they might need support for? Great. So that, um, I guess the easiest way for me to define that is so often, and Lee and I had talked about this when I was doing the horticultural therapy program. So often I think horticultural therapy is almost reserved for um, students with um, significant learning differences or autism or significant physical disabilities. Um, these very like specific diagnoses <laughs> that People have then said, okay, we're going to help, you know, with therapies and other ways to, to, to work with these students. Shipley is a very normal school. We have um, a, a robust college counseling program. We have very um, academically rigorous courses. It's a college preparatory school. We're sending students to Ivy League institutions every year. And so I think that that's a population that when it comes to horticultural therapy, folks often say like, well, if it's a typical school and a typical classroom and they're strong and they don't need a lot of supports, then they're probably fine and they don't need this. And I would argue that um, horticulture and the therapeutic benefits of it benefit everyone. Right. And so we do have students, if you could see in that the slide where I had the quotes from students, they have kids who are super stressed out, who are super anxious about things and going to the greenhouse and working with the plants helps them, um, you know, helps relieve them of that. Um, the most common conversation that happens when I'm in the greenhouse with students is usually about you know, tests. And so they're normalizing feeling stressed or feeling anxious or feeling nervous about different things. And so that can be a really supportive environment for that. Um, we certainly have students with learning differences and we have students on the autism spectrum and we have, you know, a range of students with other needs. But I would say that like typically the, the best supports are for those kind of everyday stressors that everyone is experiencing and that the COVID-19 pandemic certainly increased in every student in every grade. Absolutely. I, I think that's so important. You know, we've got a program at UF going right now for college students with stress, anxiety, depression, loneliness, things like that. And there's a lot of literature out there talking about how stressful, <laughs> how many students are so stressed in these ways, and this was before COVID even, but having two daughters in high school, I am seeing it in, in the high school, I'm seeing it in the middle school, so I think being able to reach students at those ages before they get to college and help them with some of these tools through nature and plants to help reduce that stress is so important because it's going to give them a much stronger foundation 
as those stressors get bigger and harder and more challenging and they're on their own away from their families in the college setting. So I think that's really awesome. We need to see that at more schools. <laughs> so if you, we've got a couple more minutes, if anybody has any further questions. Um, Sarah, is there anything maybe sort of, uh, if, you know, one takeaway from your experiences that you'd like everybody to know about that you could maybe share? Hmm. Um, I mean, I don't give up. <laughs> That's the thing. It took many, many, many years of like stressing how important this is to our students and coming up with different ways to demonstrate that for this to move from being a small club in the upper school to something that more students have had access to. Um, and I think the the other piece, so not giving up and then like, if you have a creative urge or you think of a crazy idea, like, oh yeah, let's go contact that cemetery and see if we can go do some gardening over there. Following through on that can really have benefits that you never thought of before. So um, follow your follow your gut and, and be creative because the little things that you think of like, oh, I don't know if this will work, will probably work out in the end to the benefit of others. That's great advice and a really wonderful way to end this webinar. So Sarah, thank you again so much. This was so great to see all these amazing things happening at the Shipley School. And um, I know that we'll be hearing more <laughs> in the future from both you and your school. So thank you so much. We appreciate your time. Thanks everyone. I had fun. Take care. <laughs>